Hi, everyone. My name is Diana Chan Morgan, and I am part of the DeepLearning.ai team, bringing you all together for all things AI community and events. Today, we are very lucky to have a workshop with some special speakers from Predibase. In this hands-on workshop, we'll discuss the unique challenges in fine-tuning LLMs and show how you can tackle these challenges with open source tools through a demo. By the end of this session, all attendees will understand how to fine-tune LLMs like Llama 2 on a single GPU, techniques like parameter-efficient tuning and quantization and how they can help, and how to deploy tuned models like Llama 2 to production with continued training with RLHF and how to use RAG to do question answering with trained LLMs. This workshop will be recorded and remain live on our YouTube channel, and you'll be able to access the notebook in the description of the video and the chat. Everything covered in the workshop is presented as continued education from our existing AI short courses, and we'll be dropping the link to access all of them in the chat. To start, I want to introduce our first speaker, Piero Molino. Piero is the co-founder and CEO of Predibase. He was one of the founding members of Uber AI Labs, where he worked on several deployed ML systems, including an NLP model for customer support and the Uber Eats recommender system with graph learning and collision detection. Later, he became a staff research scientist at Stanford University, working on machine learning systems. He is the author of Ludwig.ai with 8,900 stars on GitHub, an open source declarative deep learning framework. In 2021, he co-founded Predibase, the low-code declarative machine learning platform built on top of Ludwig. Hey, Piero. Hey, Diana. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, we're so excited to have you here. <laughs> and for our second speaker, we have Travis Adair. Travis is a co-founder and CTO of Predibase, a low-code platform for predictive and generative AI. Within the Linux Foundation, he serves as lead maintainer for the Horovod Distributed Deep Learning Framework and as a co-maintainer of the Ludwig Declarative Deep Learning Framework. In the past, he led Uber's deep training learning team, deep learning training team as part of the Michelangelo machine learning platform. We're so excited to have them here today, and we can't wait to see what they have in store for us. So, Piero, take it away. Thank you so much, Diana. I'm also super excited and, you know, uh, uh, I've been part of this community uh, from the other side of the deep learning AI. So contributing to it and somehow it's really, you know, uh, it's really great for me. So let's start talking about efficient uh, fine tuning for Lama 2 70 billion on a single GPU because it's not that easy to make it run on a single GPU. Um, Diana already introduced us, so I will skip this slide. But let's talk about what we'll cover. Uh, so first of all, I want to give you like a little bit of an overview of how I think about um, fine tuning and why would you want to fine tune an LLM to begin with. Um, I will introduce Ludwig, which is um, the low code uh, framework that for building custom AI models that I developed when I was at Uber and now is like the foundation of our technology at Predibase. And also what are the challenges of fine tuning, um, in particular the memory bottleneck and how to overcome them through you know, different techniques to squeeze the 70 billion parameters into something that uh, fits into the 16 gigabytes of VRAM of commodity um, GPUs and hardware. And so we will cover half precision, quantized training, low rank adaptation called LoRa, and QLoRa, the quantized version of it. And we'll also show you like a little demo of how to make this work uh, on your own. So uh, why to fine tune your own LLM to begin with? Um, this is like a graphic that I created that basically shows uh, a distribution of AI tasks within organizations and uh, with respect to the availability of data within organizations. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see that um, if you have a lot, a lot of data in your organization, then you can even go as far as training your, mo your models from scratch. It will be pretty expensive, but it's certainly doable. Uh, but if you have um, in a reasonable range of data, uh, and already have pre-trained models that you can uh, use, you can fine tune them on your tasks to get really, really good performance. Uh, if you don't have a lot of data, the best choice that you have right now is to um, do in-context learning through, for instance, retrieval augmented generation using general models. But what we will focusing on is the fine tuning part in particular, because it has like a really great trade-off in terms of accuracy versus performance and speed. Um, in, with respect to the bigger, more general models, in particular because you can take like a smaller model like um, Llama uh, 2 70 billion, uh, 7 billion and fine tune it on your data to make it perform as if it was a 70 billion model or even better than that. 
So um, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about Ludwig so that um, uh, that is the tool that we're going to use for showcasing these capabilities. Uh, my experience when I was um, at Uber uh, working on different machine learning applications uh, was that through all of them, like for instance, the intent classification model for customer support, the fraud prediction one, and the product recommender for Uber Eats that Diana mentioned, um, in all of these cases, um, there was a lot of code that needed to be written, and the development process took a long time, not really for writing the code, but for iterating and experimenting. And then the deployment uh, of these models also took a long time. So I thought that it could be a better way for doing this. That's why I came, out with, uh, came up with Ludwig, which is, uh, again, an open source declarative machine learning uh, framework, in particular tailored for deep learning use cases. And um, what does it mean to be like a declarative machine learning framework? It means that you can specify your uh, deep learning pipelines by just using a configuration file. And uh, the configuration file uh, only contains information, uh, only needs to contain information about the schema of your data, uh, what are the inputs, what are the outputs, and what are the data types associated with them. In this example, you have one input sentence with type text and one output intent with type category. And this six-line configuration matches 100% the performance of the intent classification model that was the one that I developed when I was at Uber. It's very easy to iterate over these models and you know, get started building models in this way. And you don't need to write a low-level machine learning code. At the same time, though, you have all the expert level of control that uh, someone who has been studying the deep learning AI classes um, gains, right? Um, you can change every parameter of your models. Uh, from the training parameters to the architectures that are used, all the way down to the single hyperparameter of the architecture, like the single activation of the single layer, and pre-processing parameters. There's more than a thousand different parameters that you can change and modify, and this makes it very easy to iterate of your models because you can just change one line in a configuration file instead of changing multiple uh, lines in your code. And finally, it's extensible, so you can write your own Python classes give them names, and if you use those names in the configuration, then you can extend the system as much as you like. Finally, it contains also advanced functionalities like uh, hyperparameter optimization, state-of-the-art models that are already baked in, and also distributed training all out of the box. So with this kind of approach, now new people that before uh, were um, not empowered to build uh, deep learning models, but you were just writing 15 lines of a YAML configuration file, in one day they were able to train a, a model for website personalization. And so these were engineers at Uber, not um, product engineers at Uber, not deep learning experts. And in one week, they managed to deploy it into, into production. And so this kind of uh, approach makes it substantially easier and faster to develop deep learning models. The reason for that is that it, at the core of it, there's this architecture which makes it possible to have multiple inputs and multiple outputs of different data types, like, for instance, categories, numerical and binary values, or text, image, and audio, and to produce as output text, numerical, binary values, and so on. Um, the inputs are first pre-processed, then encoded with a, a you know, piece of a deep learning model that produces vector representations that are then combined by one single component, to um, be provided then to the decoding components that produce from these vectors the final predictions um, of the different types. And you can imagine how mixing and matching different types of inputs and outputs can lead to different uh, machine learning applications. So for instance, if you have category uh, numerical and binary values as input and numerical values as output, you're basically training a regression model. If you have text as, text as input and category as output, then you're training a text classifier, or an image as input and text as output, then you have an image captioning system. And you can imagine how many combinations of types of inputs and types of outputs uh, lead to different applications and how flexible this approach is. Uh, notably, also, um, if you have, in particular, text as input and text as output, you can definitely use uh, um, an LLM for attacking these kind of tasks. And in particular, if you have this kind of data, then you can use it for fine-tuning those LLMs. Here I'm showing you a configuration where you just specify the model type, LLM, the base model, which is Lamanchu 70 billion, 7 billion, sorry, and um, inputs and outputs um, text uh, features. And you can specify also the parameters of the trainer, like the learning rate, the batch size, the gradient accumulations, the number of epochs, and a few others, like decay or any other kind of um, optimizer-related um, um, parameter. 
uh, once you write a configuration like this, uh, you can just provide it to the constructor of the Ludwig model object and then call train providing also the data frame containing your data. This will uh, fine tune the entire model, both the embedding part and then also the prediction part. But if you wanted to um, fine tune a model to perform a new task, so you're basically replacing the head of the model with um, a task specific head, what you can do is you can change the output features to contain, in this case, a category output. For instance, a sentiment a category output. And then you can specify the um, large language model as an encoder for your, uh, for your, uh, for your task. Uh, the rest of the training and the how, how do you create a model and how you train it is exactly the same. And you could do the same thing if you want to actually just freeze uh, the weights of the large language model. Uh, if you do that, uh, the advantage is that you can also cache the embeddings, which makes training substantially faster. Uh, at the expense usually of some performance, because at this, um, in this case, you are training just the classifier head and not the um, core uh, trunk of the model. In all of these cases, though, um, the problem is that these large language models are, in particular, like Lama 7 billion, are larger than what fits in the memory of, of a GPU. Um, there are like newer and better GPUs, like the H100 and the A100, that have quite large VRAMs of 80 gigabytes. Uh, the problem is that they are pretty expensive in, on, from cloud providers. And also, there's currently a pretty bad shortage of these uh, GPUs, meaning that if you request from AWS a GPU like that, it may require quite some time to obtain one if, it, if you will get it uh, eventually, right? And so uh, the better idea is to use actually commodity GPUs like T4s or the RTX 4080, which is like a consumer grade one that you could go out and buy. Um, and uh, the problem with these GPUs is that they have only 16 gigabytes of VRAM. Because of that, uh, you need to be a little bit smarter in what you do in order to fit the models into the 16 gigabytes of RAM. And this is like what now Travis will uh, talk about in his section of the presentation. And also, we show you how to do it within Ludwig. All right. Thank you very much, Piero. All right. Hopefully, everyone can see my screen OK. So as Piero said, um, the main issue that we want to talk about today is how to make the most use of very finite uh, resources, which when we're talking about training large language models is almost always the uh, VRAM or the amount of uh, memory that your GPU card has available to it. And that's in particular because you know, your T4 or your 4080 um, typically has about 16 gigabytes of RAM. And for the purposes of this, visualization, every one of these squares you can think of as being, you know, a gigabyte. But if you want to train even a fairly modestly sized large language model like Llama 2 7 billion, 7 billion parameters when you actually want to go and train ends up looking like something like this in terms of the memory requirements. And so if we break this down into uh, three different buckets, the model parameters, the gradients that are produced during training, and then the optimizer state that's needed to uh, to keep track of the, the training variables, then what you find is that uh, you need about 28 gigabytes uh, just for the model parameters themselves, and then an equivalent amount for the gradients during training. And then usually you need about 2x the number of the memory used for the model parameters for keeping track of the optimizer state. So in total, you're looking at about 96 gigabytes more memory than you actually have available. And so, you know, the idea of trying to pack all this into 16 gigabytes on a, the surface might seem like an impossible task, but that's exactly what we're going to do in this talk is kind of break this down piece by piece until we get into something that is very manageable and, and fits on this single, uh, single card. So let's start with the first piece, which is just loading the model in the first place, right? So the very first thing you run into is that because you have 7 billion parameters and every one of these parameters is by default represented as a 32-bit floating point. 32-bit floating point means four bytes, right? So that means you're looking at seven times four, which is 28 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, 
So that's the first uh, hurdle we need to overcome here is how do we pack the model parameters into a smaller form factor? So you may be familiar with the fact that there are different ways to represent a floating point. Um, you know, floating point 32 is the one that we most commonly use because it gives you a really nice mix of uh, the dynamic range, which is expressed as the exponent here in orange, as well as the precision, which is expressed as the significant, also sometimes called the mantissa, uh, here in the blue, right? And so very natural thing you might say is, well, what if instead of using float 32, we go down to float 16? Uh, there's a trade-off there, which is that if you, you know, just use float 16 by itself, you can, uh, you know, obviously reduce your, your memory requirements by half, but, you know, you're going to uh, non-linearly decrease the range of values that you can represent uh, because you're reducing this exponent, right? And so that can lead to a very significant drop in um, the, uh, how big a range of values you can represent, particularly for your gradients, which can lead to things like vanishing gradients or exploding gradients, which can lead to NANDs and things like that. Uh, so one alternative that exists for people that have the hardware is to use a data type called uh, bfloat, stands for brain float, came out of Google, is now officially supported on newer generation uh, cards like the Ampere, you know, A100s and things like that. But for those of us still using, you know, T4s um, and lower generation hardware, you know, you have to stick to something like float 16. So there's a trade-off there. But if you were to go with float 16 or bfloat 16, you know, that right there allows you to cut the memory down in half, 14 gigabytes. Suddenly, you know, you can fit everything on your single card and, you know, no problems. But very quickly, you run into the next problem, which is the gradient. So gradients, um, you know, I'm sure most folks here are familiar with the normal stochastic gradient descent training process. But essentially what happens is uh, during the training process, you produce a forward pass over the model. You know, those are what we call the activations. And then when you compute those activations, you want to then use uh, the results to compare against the target that you're trying to predict. And then the difference between the prediction and the actual target is then used to uh, produce these gradients, which are used to then uh, do the back propagation and then ultimately update the model. So the problem is that the gradients are uh, typically use the same data type as the original model parameters. And there's typically one gradient for every model parameter that you have, particularly the ones that you want to train and update. And so as a result, anytime you're doing normal gradient descent training, you're looking at about a, a 2x just without any optimizer on the amount of memory required for training. So how do we go uh, beyond this? Well, one approach is to say, well, is there something lower than uh, float 16 that we can do, maybe 8-bit? And at this point, oftentimes, um, a common technique would be to use quantization. So when we say quantization, what we mean is taking a continuous space, like the space represented by a floating point value, and discretizing it into a specific finite number of bins, uh, which can be represented just as integers, right? Kind of like an index, like, you know, one equals bin one and three equals bin two, et cetera. And so, you know, naively, you could do this just by very, you know, simply slicing up the space uniformly and then bucking them all together. But in practice, you often find that values are concentrated in certain parts of the, the range. So for example, you have a higher concentration of values here towards the mean. And so if you were to just naively bucket things, you would lose a lot of precision towards the mean at the expense of, uh, you know, in, in exchange for basically getting more precision towards the outer edges of the distribution, which is not really what you want, right? You want to retain that nuance as much as possible. And so usually what you end up doing is calculating some statistics about what each bin uh, represents in terms of what values are in there. Um, and that allows you to then reconstruct this uh, distribution when you want to go back to a floating point value in the future without losing much of the, of the data, right? And so outlier clipping is another approach that's commonly used under the hood to, you know, avoid this problem of completely shifting your buckets too much based on like very extreme values. And so, you know, this seems like a very complicated process, uh, but the nice thing about declarative frameworks like Ludwig is that we make it very simple. You just say quantization bits equals eight and boom, you get all this compression for free essentially.
So let's say you do that. So once again, we cut everything in half. So essentially now we have only seven gigabytes uh, required to allocate the model parameters and an additional seven gigabytes required for the gradients. That means we're only using 14 of our 16 gigabytes, right? So great. Um, however, the real kicker is the optimizer. And I think a lot of people don't realize this initially, but uh, if you're using um, a very common state-of-the-art uh, optimizer like Atom, um, Atom is great. People love it. It you know, has become like a de facto standard in the industry, but it does have quite a high memory footprint, which a lot of people don't initially think about, but is very real. And in particular, as I said, you have 2x the number of parameters um, due to the additional vectors that you're keeping track of for the optimizer. And that leads to very significant uh, problems, as you can see here, where essentially all the parameters of the optimizer are completely out of memory. Now, one question you might have is, why does Atom use so much memory? And this is the normal update formula for how you update the, the weights based on the gradients. So these uh, parameters here, the gradients, and then you know Ws are the weights. Um, and then these parameters here, M and V is momentum and variance. And these are two Atom specific parameters that are essentially vectors the same length as the gradients, right? And so we don't need to really get into the math here, but the important part is that this you know, M uh, momentum vector and this V variance vector, they're each 7 billion parameters in, in size. And so that means that that's ultimately where your 2x value is coming from in terms of you know, 2x the model parameters are needed just for the optimizer. So what can we do about this? Well, this is where a technique that you might have heard of called low rank adaptation comes in. And the interesting thing about low rank adaptation or LoRa, this was a technique pioneered by uh, folks at Microsoft Research. Um, I linked the, the paper down there in the bottom right. Um, the interesting thing about this technique is that we often talk about it as a way to reduce the number of trainable parameters to you know, reduce the size of uh, the footprint of the, of the model weights when you save it and speed up training. And those are all true. But I actually think the most valuable initial thing about LoRa is that it significantly reduces the number of parameters need to, that need to be tracked by the optimizer as well as the gradients. And that's what ultimately leads to a very significant memory reduction um, during training. And just as a quick kind of uh, refresher or, or kind of explanation of what LoRa is really doing. Um, so the key idea behind LoRa is that when you're fine tuning a very powerful model like uh, Llama, you don't actually need to fine tune literally every single parameter. There are typically some parameters, uh, some layers, let's say, that are more important than others. Usually things like the uh, parts that do attention and you know determining which uh, tokens in the sequence are related to the other tokens and in what way are they related. And so the idea behind LoRa is essentially to take those, uh, those parameters, those matrices, for like the you know queries uh, and keys and things like that, and then inject a, uh, a another kind of lower rank uh, matrix uh, beside it that initially acts as some, somewhat of an identity function, so it's not really doing anything. But then over time, when you you know propagate these gradients through and update the parameters, the only thing you're actually modifying is this uh, ancillary uh, matrix that you've added uh, side by side. And so really the only parameters you need to update are here. And that means that the total amount of space you need to save is just this little extra matrix. And that additionally means that your optimizer and gradients are only taken with respect to these parameters and not these big pre-trained weights. The pre-trained weights are essentially frozen. And again, uh, this is all done in, in Ludwig by the declarative config with just a single parameter, which is nice. So let's say we do this. Let's say we use LoRa and we, um, you know, now have ad added these additional um, low rank matrices alongside our existing parameters. What does that do to our overall memory footprint? And so it's not 100% like as easy as saying that, you know, the number of parameters is uh, in the optimizer is 2x the uh, parameters in the model or anything like that because um, the number of parameters that you add during the lower process can vary depending on some of the hyperparameters you set for it, like uh, the R, which is you know how many, um, the rank of the matrices you're gonna add. And then you can also 
change which uh, layers you want to add these uh, low rank adaptation matrices to as well. So it's, uh, it's something that can vary a bit, but in practice, it can be as low as 0.1% of all of the parameters in the model, which is huge. And even in like kind of a, a more aggressive case, you're typically looking at something like less than 10% of the parameters, usually like 1% of the parameters um, are actually going to be modified uh, with LoRa. And so, you know, one way that we might kind of, you know, split the difference a bit is say, you know, let's assume that uh, one gigabyte of memory is going to be used for these LoRa parameters. Now, importantly, um, in the formulation of, of doing quantized training, normally what you do, and this was in the QLoRa paper that we'll talk about, is you quantize the original model parameters, the ones in orange here. So these are represented in int eight. Uh, but the LoRa parameters, those you typically do in um, FP16 or FP32. Here we're doing FP16. And that's because since these are the parameters that you're training, uh, you typically want a little bit higher precision on those. Um, and that just, and since there's so few of them, it doesn't make that much of a difference anyway in practice um, in terms of the memory overhead. So 16-bit um, LoRa parameters here plus the gradients for those 16-bit parameters, so 2x, plus the optimizer state. And the optimizer state here I'll say is usually uh, FP32, which is why it's, you know, not just um, 2x the number of parameters, but 4x. So we have, you know, 2x the number of parameters times 2 when we go from FP16 to FP32. And so, you know, back of the envelope math, you might be looking at about four gigabytes of optimizer state uh, just using LoRa and int8. But there's still one more problem, which is the activations themselves. And so activations are, you know, when you're doing the initial forward pass, uh, effectively the memory overhead from activations, so what comes out of each layer, is going to be um, the size of the largest layer in your network, um, also times the batch size. So how many examples you're updating uh, at once, right? And again, this is not a kind of hard and fast thing because you know if you increase your batch size, you're going to have more activation memory to deal with. Uh, if you change, you know, some layer parameters, you might have more activations to deal with. But you know, back to the envelope math, you might be looking at about like four to five gigabytes of memory from activation, something like that. Um, and so that is potentially another big thing that's going to cause you to have to deal with out-of-memory errors, even if you get everything else under control. So what can we do? How about one more trick, which is, can we go from 8-bit quantization all the way down to 4-bit? And so this was one of the most, I think, interesting and kind of uh, groundbreaking things that came out of the QLoRa paper. And so credit to Tim Detmers, um, you know, linked his uh, tweet there for the original image source here, but definitely check out uh, the paper that that he and others did on uh, QLoRa, which I think has been like a really big game changer for this you know efficient fine tuning approach. So the way that this uh, technique essentially works is that you go from you know full fine tuning to LoRa, which only adjusts these adapter weights, right? And then with QLoRa, what you essentially do is the base model parameters are represented now with just four bits. And that's because, again, you're only doing kind of the forward pass on these. You're not having to update these parameters or anything like that. The adapters still in FP16, still 16 bit. But then now you have this um, optimizer state as well, which is FP32. And one additional thing that they did in the QLoRa paper which we won't get too much into here, but is um, you know one additional thing they did to reduce memory pressure was introduce this paged uh, atom implementation, which allowed them to essentially offload the optimizer parameters to the CPU uh, when needed to reduce the the, pro the uh, effects of memory spikes during training, and effectively get this whole thing down to some very very small form factor that can train on you know very a uh, commodity hardware, right? Um, but specifically, we'll focus on the four-bit part here um, for the purposes of, of the diagram here. And so, you know, the way they did this, they introduced a new data type. They called it normal float four. Um, definitely recommend checking out the paper for more details on it. Effectively, what they did was they defined like kind of a hard-coded bucketing system. Um, the main idea was to try to avoid the problem of 
um, not having a way to represent zeros. They kind of you know worked around that problem pretty cleverly. Um, but essentially, you do all this. Um, you know, now all of a sudden you go from int eight down to normal flow four. Seven billion parameters can fit in just three point five gigabytes of VRAM. The LoRa and, uh, params and the gradients are still the same in FP sixteen. Your optimizer state is still the same um, here in in green. And then finally, you have um, and apologies that this is five instead of four green squares. And then finally, you have your activations uh, in red here, which are just now at about uh, three gigabytes. Because again, when you reduce the uh, model parameters, you're also reducing the size of the activations themselves, which is a nice benefit. And so all in, you might be looking at only around 13.5 gigabytes peak memory usage required here. So let's talk about one last thing here, which is your batch size. So typically um, during training, we try to pack multiple sequences into a single batch. Uh, one of the reasons to do this is less to do with efficiency of training, because often when you're training on small hardware, um, you know, you're lucky to be able to get one uh, sample in a batch at a time, let alone two or four, et cetera. But one downside to doing that is uh, it kind of it, it can increase the variance in the training process in a way that's uh, not desirable. So, if you think about back to you know uh, CS two twenty nine, like um, or you know like kind of basics of of training processes, um, you know you have on one end of the extreme pure stochastic gradient descent, so just like one uh, sample is one update, all the way to full batch gradient descent, and you know, the re one of the reasons why we don't like to do full stochastic gradient descent is it's a very noisy kind of walk through the optimization space, right? You can oftentimes take, you know, lots of small turns in different directions, whereas as you increase the batch size, you take bigger steps and it kind of smooths out the process. And so this kind of, you know, sitting in a nice middle ground between, you know, taking these big smooth steps and taking these very uh, jerky small steps it's one of the arts of, of deep learning, but in general, you do want to kind of hit a sweet spot there in the middle, um, which is why we often use uh, batch sizes in the area of like 32, 64, 128. But the problem is if you um, are you know only able to pack a single example into your uh, model at a time for training, you end up doing this like very janky stochastic gradient descent thing. So how do we work around that? And this is the last technique I want to talk about today, which is gradient accumulation. And so the key idea behind gradient accumulation is that you can get the effects of training with a larger batch without the additional uh, memory overhead. And the way it essentially works is you do a normal forward pass. So here's a, a batch size in, of two in this case. Um, and you can ignore the fact that this is a multi-GPU example. Like we can just kind of generalize this to one GPU. You do a backward pass, but then instead of updating the model params, um, you store it in a buffer and then do another forward pass and another backward pass. And then um, basically sum, sum those two uh, together into a single vector, uh, which you then, you know, if you're doing distributed training, you would then sum it once again in the all reduced step um, or continue doing accumulation for subsequent steps. And the effect here is that you basically have a larger batch size without having to increase the memory overhead by doing it in one step. Uh, so now, you know, your total uh, update that you apply to the model is however many uh, accumulations you did. Uh, and that can help smooth out the training process to lead to better model convergence. Putting it all together, um, this is how this whole thing would look in a Ludwig config, um, uh, as Piero showed you before. So. We say our model type is LLM, so this is, means a text generating large language model. We're going to use Llama 2 7 billion as the base model. We're going to use uh, LoRa for doing the low rank adaptation. Quantization uh, in four bits. We're going to specify the prompt template, uh, which is how you define your task uh, given the input columns of your data set. Uh, we're going to specify that this is a text to text model, so input and output features are just text. And then our fine tuning parameters um, are going to be, you know, a certain learning rate, some number of epochs that we train for, and an effective batch size of 32.
And then that's effectively it. And with that, you can just you know call Ludwig model from this config, train it on your data set, and you're off to the races. And so in the next section, I'll show you a, a Colab notebook that you can run yourself that does this all on a single T4 GPU, which you can get for free in, in Colab. Um, but before that, just kind of summarizing what we talked about here. Uh, so the different techniques that we covered, and there are a few that we didn't cover today uh, that I wanted to also call out. So half precision, this is how you can reduce the model parameter memory footprint, the gradient footprint, and the activation footprint. And then if you want to go beyond reducing precision, quantization allows you to get the same effect, but in a more aggressive manner. Low rank adaptation, this techniques, technique helps you reduce the footprint of the gradients as well as the optimizer state. Gradient accumulation helps you reduce the footprint of the gradients and the activations. And then a couple of techniques we didn't talk about today. So paging in the optimizers, this was one from QLora, helps you reduce the, great, the memory footprint of the optimizers. And then one last one uh, that's worth checking out if you're still running into issues is gradient checkpointing, uh, which reduces the memory overhead from the gradients even further by basically recalculating them um, during the backward pass instead of just storing all the data. Um, so yeah, there are lots of different techniques available to you um, in, uh, in Ludwig. And so I definitely recommend checking it out. And so to give you, to motivate this a bit, uh, let's go ahead and jump into a hands-on tutorial. And you know, this link here shows you how you can get at this notebook yourself to try it out. Um, and yeah, please give it a shot and, and let us know how it goes. So let's go ahead and jump into the notebook. So the motivating example here is going to be uh, using LLMs for code generation. And I think this one is particularly timely because Meta, of course, recently released a new set of code generating models fine-tuned on Llama 2. And so you, know, you might naturally ask yourself, well, how could I have done the same thing myself, right? And so the purpose of this demo will be to show you that it's really not that hard. You just have a good data set and you know you can do it with a relatively minimal amount of uh, data to build a custom code completion model uh, that's bespoke to you know the type of code that you write, right? So it's tailored to you and, and your use case as opposed to a general purpose one. And the way that we're going to frame it is um, in this kind of alpaca style. We're going to use the code alpaca data set um, where you have an instruction like create an array of length five, which contains all even numbers between one and 10. And the idea is that the model should produce a response like array equals two, four, six, eight, ten. Now, as you recall from the slides, uh, Ludwig lets you train models just with a very simple YAML based configuration file. Um, and so to get started with Ludwig, uh, you just download it with pip install. Here I'm going to build off of the uh, main branch of Ludwig, uh, but uh, because we were trying out a couple of newer features like the effective batch size stuff. Um, but the latest version of Ludwig 0 0.8 um, also contains all of these LLM capabilities as well. And one thing that's definitely important to call out, I think a lot of people run into this issue with Llama 2, is that you know while Llama 2 is a bit freely available for commercial use and the weights are you know readily available online um, it is gated in the sense that you need to get explicit approval to download the weights and so the way it works is kind of described here is that you go to um, hugging face's website and you basically get a, an api token that kind of says you know this is me and then you request access to uh, the Llama 2 weights. Uh, and it should be a pretty quick process to get approval. Uh, but once you have that, you just plug in your uh, API token here. It'll prompt you for the token. And you're able to start downloading the weights. From there, we're going to take this code generation data set. So this is um, the Code Alpaca 20,000 example. Um, and you know we do a little bit of pre-processing here because we want to create a custom uh, training and test split of the data. And when we go ahead and print it out, you know, here's the first 10 rows of the data. Um, you can see that the format is, you know, hey, create an array of length 10. And then here's the output, which is what we expect the model to produce. We also have a column here called split, which says, you know, zero if it's in the training split, um, two if it's in the test split, et cetera. 
And then you'll also notice that there's an optional column here called input, which um, is used in cases where the instruction is more like a template instruction. So for example, the instruction here is write a replace method for a string, which replaces the given string with a given set of characters. And then the, the input, you know, string equals hello world replaced with greetings. And then it's going to give you this function that uh, does exactly this operation, right? So this is again, all very standard uh, process for the Alpaca style data sets out there. All right, so um, one thing to point out is that uh, there are some, uh, like the distribution here of the data is actually pretty good as well. So one thing that came up in the questions was, you know, how do I get a good data set? How do I make sure that, um, you know, my model learns something and isn't just kind of producing garbage? And it's very important in general in all model training processes, and it's true in fine tuning as well, that having a um, good uh, a good data set is very important. And so, you know, here's just a kind of quick breakdown of you know what we're looking at here. So, you know, number of characters in the instructions, number of characters in the output, number of characters in the input. You can see that there's definitely a pretty high bias towards um, smaller snippets of data, et cetera. Um, but having that variation ends up being very important. Uh, that there is still, you know, a pretty nice distribution here um, for the model to be able to handle, you know, future unseen scenarios, right? Um, so just in general, a comment that um, when you're training a model, when you're doing fine tuning, definitely make sure that you get as much breadth as possible, uh, so that you're not ending up in a situation where your model overfits, right? So standard best practices still apply. Now, one thing that's really cool about Ludwig is that we can do a zero shot and a few shot inference as well to kind of get a sense for how the model does even without any fine tuning. And zero shot learning, for those who aren't familiar, is just basically where you tell the model in plain English or whatever language the model is trained in, hey, do the thing I'm asking you to do. So for example, you know, write a function that you know uh, reverses a string or something like that, right? And I don't want to get into too many of the details here in the interest of time, but this is all done in Ludwig via this prompt template, which lets you specify um, the instruction. So in a zero shot way, I can very simply say, you know, here's an instruction paired with an input, write a response, give the input, which comes, you know, this is a column in the data set. This is also a column in the data set. And then I just specify these generation parameters. Um, which uh, will then go ahead and evaluate uh, the model on, on this data set, right? Without any training at all. So this is a zero shot run. And if we just kind of look through um, the outputs, you can see that, um, you know, it says, for example, instruction, write a function to remove all white space from a given string, and it outputs my string, hello world. So if you're familiar with, uh, or sorry, hello world, right? So. Um, that's actually not the worst thing in the world, right? But uh, it does understand that there is this thing, remove white space, that is a function. Um, however, um, you know, it's not really doing the task as, uh, as we requested it, right? It's just kind of outputting some, uh, something that looks like appropriate English or looks kind of appropriately appropriate from a syntactic, syntactic or semantic standpoint, but not really from a correctness standpoint. And so this is, you know, the main motivation behind fine tuning is that these large language models out of the box do a good job at kind of comprehending text, comprehending um, language, but they don't do a good job at following specific instructions for doing specific tasks without doing fine tuning. And so that's the goal, right? Is we want to go from something like this, where we want to, where it's just gonna output, you know, some uh, correct English text that kind of looks right, but until you until you squint at it, right, to something that is actually correct, which is, okay, response array equals two four six eight ten for this task of um, creating an array that contains all even numbers, right? So um, definitely let you uh, read the the details there on your own um, if you're interested in going diving deeper. But effectively, what we do is. We now can specify the full fine tuning config, which essentially is these three additional sections here. 
So we're going to again specify Laura as the adapter, quantization, and then our fine tuning trainer um, is going to consist of all these parameters. Most of these are just defaults, um, but they're kind of spelled out here um, to kind of hark back to what we talked about in the slides. So we're going to use gradient accumulation. We're going to set a very low learning rate. We're going to use Atom as our optimizer with some of these default uh, hyperparams. And then last, we're going to do a little bit of warm up of our learning rate uh, to help smooth out that learning process. And we click train, and then we go ahead and uh, start the training process. And you can see that um, over time, we, you know, not running it here just in the interest of time, but this uh, example here, we've got about 100 data points, it takes like five minutes to run or something around that space on the T4. And then at the very end, you get some uh, metric output about you know, what the loss is. You can see that the loss is, in fact, decreasing over time, which is what you want. And also some additional metrics uh, like the perplexity, uh, the sequence accuracy, token accuracy, et cetera. And then lastly, um, we can go ahead and take the model that we've trained and produce some sample uh, input and outputs. And what we see is that now, even though we've only trained it on 100 samples, which seems like a very, very low amount, right? Um, we're starting to get something that looks pretty decent, right? So create an array of length 5, which contains all even numbers between 1 and 10. And yeah, the output here is a variable, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. It's starting to look pretty good, right? So what you can tell is that the model actually does know quite a lot already about what it needs to do. It just didn't know how to do it. And that was kind of the purpose of this instruction tuning thing is teaching it uh, you know, how to structure its output given what it already knows, right? Um, which is it understands the concepts of even numbers and functions and, and Python code and things like that. So yeah, that's essentially it. I encourage you to go and try it yourself. And then once you've trained the model, uh, these adapter weights are compliant with the existing Hugging Face API. And Ludwig makes it very easy to go and upload uh, these uh, adapter weights back to the Hugging Face Hub as well. So you can serve these models, share them with your friends, et cetera. And finally, um, if you want to go beyond um, you know, training on a single T4, you might ask, how do I train these seven, 70 billion parameter models? How do I do distributed training and things like that? And certainly Ludwig makes it easy to do that as well. We've got a lot of good resources on training with uh, deep speed and um, training on Kubernetes clusters. And then if you want a managed platform, that's what we're building at Predibase. So definitely happy to, to chat anytime about, about that as well. And with that, um, I'll go ahead and hand it back to um, uh, Piero to wrap it up, uh, if you'd like to say anything else about uh, it, just to, to hand it off to you, Piero, to close things out. But uh, yeah, happy to take questions at the end as well, if there are any. Sorry, I was muted for a second. And yeah, so thank you very much, Travis, for, for this overview. I think, um, you know, hopefully looking at what people were uh, telling us and asking in the in the chat, there was a lot of excitement for this. I wanted to just really quickly um, recap what we've covered and just give you a little call to action if you want. Uh, so first of all, you know, we covered why you want to fine tune uh, your own models um, and your own LLMs. Then we gave an introduction to Ludwig with you know, uh, all the capabilities around the creative configurations for um, building your own uh, machine learning models. Um, we address the memory bottleneck issues um, with you know, all these techniques to squeeze the 7 billion parameter models into something that works inside 16 gigabytes of RAM, like half precision, quantized training, LoRaN adaptation, LoRa, and QLoRa. And uh, hopefully the demo was interesting. Um, so. Uh, the, the very last slide here that I have is uh, check out Ludwig. Uh, we have you know a lot of documentation on Ludwig.ai. Uh, you can you know find it on GitHub. There's more than 9,000 stars on GitHub. Uh, more than 130 contributors. So if you want to participate in the community, uh, we also have a Slack channel that you can you know uh, join, and uh, it's all open source and it's backed by the Linux Foundation. And if you're interested in customizing your private and privately hosted LLMs in, uh, uh, in the cloud with uh, a platform uh, that supports you along the way, um, check out the 
pretty base free trial and uh, you will not be disappointed. Yeah, this is all I wanted to cover and happy to, you know, take questions and uh, answer some. Amazing. Thank you so much um, for both uh, Travis and Piero. Amazing session. We have so many questions. We can't get to all of them, but I'm sure we definitely have for the first time at one of these events, we actually have a good amount of time <laughs> to go through them. So very, very well, uh, well presented. Uh, so the first question is what data set preparation methods for fine tuning do you consider the most effective? Mm. Maybe I can take this one. Um, so there are, I think there are some uh, little finicky aspects of fine tuning LLMs that may not be, um, from the data perspective, that may not be um, super apparent from, from the get go. And um, I think, you know, addressing them is important. On one hand, one thing that you for sure want to make sure that you do when you prepare your data, you want to make sure that you, uh, for the same prompt, you, you have like, you don't repeat prompts. There's like one prompt and one um, answer to that prompt or one, you know, um, um, continuation of, of that prompt. Uh, the reason is that because of the relatively smaller sides of these fine tuning data sets, if there is um, um, repeated prompts with different answers, that may be confusing for the model. And I would say th there's a lot to be said about how you know to um, tokenize the data and you know add uh, specific separators. Um, there's quite some literature about it, but I would, in short, I will say make sure that when you prepare the data, you um, leave enough um, tokens uh, in between the inputs and the outputs, and you make sure that there's separators like, you know, you can use uh, return characters, or you can use like um, uh, dashes or pound signs or things like that, just to make it very clear where the input starts and the uh, ends, and where the output starts and the output ends. And also at the end of the output, make sure that you leave like um, uh, signs or white spaces even before and after um, because uh, models can be finicky and if the um, if those characters are not present there it could be possible that the model will have a hard time identifying when it needs to stop so um, just be sure to follow these basic instructions and you know the fine tuning will work right away perfect uh, well that leads us to our next question Rag versus fine tuning. Which strategy works better and for when? Maybe I can uh, give a perspective on this. Um, uh, like I was sharing that very first slide where I had that graph uh, with the, actually, maybe I can show it again if, if that's fine, um, because I think that could be revealing, I would say, at least from my point of view, that's actually pretty useful. So let me share it once again. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So, um, this is, it's a little bit of an oversimplification because there's multiple dimensions to this, but um, I would say that the amount of available data is definitely um, a factor to consider. Um, RAG, um, in particular for doing specific tasks like uh, for improving classification or for improving generation of, of you know, summaries or, or other things like that, or, or uh, is particularly good when you don't have a lot of data. And so you can rely on that as a, you know, stopgap solution before you have enough data to actually fine tune a model. Um, the other aspects to consider are that um, usually to get a similar performance that you would get, like the, the delta between fine tuning and RAG is also in the size of the models. You can fine tune a substantially smaller model to be very effective. Uh, in RAG, you don't have that level of control. You just need to use whatever model is available to you. And so, you know, there is a difference uh, in the inference time, in particular, if you need to also add a component for retrieving the data points and examples that you will need to fit into the, uh, into the prompt, right? Which, you know, you can use um, vector stores, which are pretty fast, but still um, they add to the, to the latency of each single query that you run. And then I would say there's a third aspect, which is, um, do you actually need to do any attribution to the sources where the information is coming from? For instance, if you're doing a question answering task um, and just providing an answer is not sufficient, you also want to provide the, the um, documents, the links to the documents where that um, answer is coming from, 
Well, in that case, RAG is the best solution. Maybe for the you know generative model, you can still use a fine-tuned model on your data, but uh, you could like combine fine-tuning and retrieval augmented generation. But uh, if you need attribution, definitely you cannot do away with RAG right now. And one uh, one thing to add on, I think Piero had a really good summary there. Uh, one thing we've definitely noticed um, some people running into gotchas with uh, fine tuning in the past is that sometimes there's a desire to use fine tuning to teach models new facts. Like you know, your fine tuning data set might be like, you know, the president of my company is so and so or whatever, right? And that's one area where currently RAG does typically do a better job than fine tuning is that kind of injecting new information into the model component typically to get a uh, and sorry rag stands for retrieval augmented generation so basically means um, using an information retrieval system like a database to fetch context and insert it into the prompt um, uh, but basically the idea then being that uh, if you want to teach a model new facts uh, usually rag ends up being the the best way to do that uh, for the cost because the alternative typically ends up being training a model from scratch or uh, there might be other ways that you can, you know, do it with with successive pre-training that end up requiring, you know, millions and even billions of tokens in some case. So um, while fine-tuning is very useful for like predictive tasks and uh, like domain adaptation tasks like building code generation or changing the style of the output or outputting JSON, that kind of teaching facts piece is probably the one Achilles heel of fine-tuning today. Absolutely. I think we have time for maybe one more question, maybe two. What hosting services do you recommend for hosting LLMs, specifically Llama? Obviously, Predibase. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, I, definitely, I think, you know, we, we kind of started the company um, with the idea of providing, like, the best in class our, uh, infrastructure for making this whole process of fine tuning and serving as simple as, as can be and, you know, el eliminating the headaches of being like, oh, this model doesn't work on this GPU or this model, you know, has out of memory errors with this batch size. So um, that's certainly, you know, one of the key value props of Predace. And I highly recommend folks checking it out if they're, if they're looking to solve that pain point. Absolutely. And let's see. How can we generate embeddings from the model rather than generating new text? Yeah, maybe I can take this one. Um, the there is in Ludwig. So we've, what we've been showing was the um, uh, creation of the Ludwig model object and then calling train on that object. Um, obviously, that same object also has a predict um, uh, function that makes it possible to run predict on new data, and there is also a um, uh, collect activation function where you can specify which layer in your uh, model do you want to collect the activations of. And um, by default, those are like the embeddings that you would use for like a downstream task or to put into a vector database or something like that. And so it's just a different um, call that you can make on the same object to obtain the embeddings. Perfect. Well, I think that means our event comes to a close. We are out of time and I know our community learned so much. So thank, thank you so much, Piero and Travis. Is there any final words that you wanted to say about Ludwig or Predibase? I would say, you know, I really thank you for, for the, you know, for the chance to chat with this community. I mean, I, I loved all the questions. So I really, really thank you for that. And um, I would suggest people to check out Ludwig. It's open source. There's, you know, it's really easy to do pip install Ludwig and try it out. There's also really nice um, documentation on online. We put a lot of effort into that. So hopefully it would be great. And if you want to contribute to it, you know, there's, there's a Slack channel you can, you can, you can join. And check out Predibase. There's a free trial. So uh, you can just try it out even, even before making any commitment. So check it out. Perfect. Well, thank you everyone for attending our event. We encourage you to keep learning by signing up for our courses and staying involved with the deep learning community. We currently are looking for feedback in our focus groups for our courses. So if you're interested in contributing towards the community, please be sure to fill out the survey that we're dropping in the chat. Otherwise, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, everyone.